Welcome back to the Sea Realm Podcast. I'm your host, KMO, and joining me here in the Sea Realm by telephone is Daniel Pinchbeck. Daniel is the author of two books, and he is also the, I'm not sure how to describe your position there, Daniel, but you are associated with Reality Sandwich, a very popular website. So, uh, editorial, editorial director. Editorial director. And Dmitry Orloff is the commander-in-chief of Club Orloff, and he is also the author of a book called Reinventing Collapse, The Soviet Example and American Prospects. Daniel Pinchbeck and Dmitry Orloff, welcome to the Sea Realm Podcast. Thank, Thank you. Great to be with you. Daniel, I have been following your writing for a while now, and your vision of the coming transformation that uh, awaits humanity is among the most optimistic that I know of. And in fact, your your optimism got you into a a little scuffle with um, Whitley Strieber a few months back. And I noticed that uh, you're starting to take seriously some of the arguments that in the past you, you did not seem to resonate much with, arguments like the one that Dimitri is putting forward in his book, and you've recently hosted a chapter of his book on Reality Sandwich. So if you would, say a little bit about how your your thinking on the coming transformation has evolved in recent months. Yeah, well, I don't think that's quite true. I mean, if you look at 2012, I mean, I, I, I begin the book discussing climate change, and I end the book talking about the Pentagon, and uh, the, actually I discuss the potential for an economic uh, collapse uh, so I, I don't think actually my, my, my position has changed um, so much. I mean, I've learned more, and it's been more refined, and definitely reading books like uh, Dimitri's book and, um, you know, so, some other works, uh, books by Alexis Ziegler and uh, uh, Richard Heinberg and so on, have, have you know, p- taken me deeper into an understanding of, of, what, of what may happen uh, as we go forward. Um, you know, personally, I mean, it's, uh, I mean I'm, I feel like probably a lot of people at the moment in, a, in, a, in a, you know, this interesting sort of paradox where on the one hand I feel, you know, anxiety, fear, you know, concern that, you know, you know, the food supply will go down and all that kind of stuff as the financial system melts down. On the other hand, I, I kind of feel like popping the champagne cork because, you know, I, I've always hated the Wall Street system and, you know, have felt this incredible manipulation of artificial value, you know, kind of sucking off the, uh, you know, the, the, the energy from the, and the life energy from the middle class and 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 the you know third world countries around the world and the idea that that whole system you know is now in a paroxysm uh, I think I think you know is kind of an an exciting one and um, you know I, I yeah I so 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 I do think that there's obviously the potential for things to become very chaotic and dislocated and dangerous and for the kind of depressing decline that Dimitri outlines to happen. But I also think that there's a whole other possibility or set of possibilities or set of prospects that are, that are much more um, uh, positive and much more uh, empowering and equally plausible. And, f- and for me, the, some of those have to do with a kind of Buckminster Fuller uh, design science approach to uh, you know, re- reinventing human society. Uh, and there's a very interesting article in, in Salon yesterday with this guy, Stuart Brand, about how you know, we're, we, even you know, even with the stresses on the ecology, uh, you know, we're we're, st- we're still kind of in in a in a in a in a world where you know we could provide for everybody. I mean, if we were to you know really investigate intensive permaculture practices, scale down waste of resources, um, you know, really think about the whole planet as as a as a single unified system, uh, we potentially could make tremendous progress. So I still feel that basically the the barrier to um, you know, a kind of positive transformation of human society is, is our is, is our limits in our consciousness and our and our kind of projections of uh, shadow and negativity onto the system. You know, which is not to be Pollyanna-ish or you know ridiculously optimistic. I just see that that that, that there's a, there's there's a prospect here for for us to uh, you know reinvent our social systems on a much on a much uh, better footing and, and, and without doubting that there's going to be some tremendous uh, you know serious difficulties and potentially hardships uh, you know along the way yeah well i don't really you know uh, have any problem with uh, trying uh, these more optimistic approaches i'm a, a big fan of uh, buckman's Fuller too and you know certain principles of his like tensegrity in design is something that i i keep in mind while doing mundane things like putting shrink wrap on my boat um not that you know i don't i think 
geodesic domes or, you know, Dynaxian vehicles are going to, to change the picture too much. But, you know, I, I, I really, I'm a big believer in experiments just for the sake of doing experiments because it keeps you busy and they're amusing things to try. Uh, as far as changing the direction of society, we have to keep in mind that, you know, rational approaches like Buckminster Fuller's are almost beside the point because uh, we're dealing with a, uh, an atavistic sort of uh, very emotional uh, species that dwells mostly in the realm of, of uh, images as opposed to, you know, any sort of rational thought. You know, that's why everybody insists on having flush toilets and driving cars that have four wheels instead of three, you know, because that's an image that's embedded in the psyche and nothing will dislodge it. You know, going back to what Daniel said about the collapse of Wall Street, I don't think that it will be replaced with anything better. This is a, basically a transfer of wealth to foreigners that, that will be ongoing for quite a while now, and uh, I don't think that they'll be nicer to us than we have been to ourselves. That would be wishful thinking. So th those are just some sort of off-the-cuff thoughts that I had while listening to Daniel. Yeah, and I, I, to, to, I, mean, I can res respond to a little of that. Um, you know, obviously, I don't, I'm not promoting the Dymaxian car and the Jesus Dome as the answer to world problems. It's more of a taking a design science approach. So, for instance, one idea that really interests me is from uh, Bernard Lettier, who was one of the architects of the euro. He's a Belgian, former Belgian currency trading superstar. And his whole perspective is that the, the basic fundamental way money is, is, has been sort of constructed has, has a deep flaw in it. Because it, it, you know, we've created a system that's basically debt-based. Like you go to the bank, you know, you, they, they, they check your credit rating and see if you can compete aggressively in our contemporary society, and then they, they loan you a certain amount of money, but so they're, but they don't create the extra money and interest that you have to bring back. So then you have to go into society and compete with everybody else in the society to bring back that, that interest, that extra money. So, you know, what, what, uh, Lettier and a lot of other writers point out, like David Corton, is that that, that creates a uh, situation where there's this constantly expanding bubble of debt, and it also creates a, a mentality of artificial scarcity. And, um, you know, I, I think what's happening now is that, you know, the, the debt-based expansion, which is at the basis of the capitalist system, is, is no longer able to, to function. And, and the reasons for that are, I think, twofold. One is that we've seen a, a globalization of the marketplace. Because, you know, if you look at earlier analyses of capitalism, including like Lenin's and Marx's and so on, you know, it requires constant expansion and penetration into new markets to survive. And so, and so that's reached its limit. And one answer to that was like uh, Naomi Klein, the shock doctrine, talked about how they began to, you know, capitalists began almost like look forward to dis destruction, like hurricanes and terrorist attacks that allowed them to rebuild, you know, aspects of, of their own society as if they were new markets, you know. But that's sort of clearly unsustainable. Now, and then the other second piece of that is is the decline in world energy production. You know, so in a way, like having a debt-fueled expansion model of, of, of uh, econom economics is only going to work as there's an increasing abundance of cheap oil, cheap energy. And so now that that, that, that energy is no longer available, there's kind of a, a law of thermodynamics in effect where, you know, the, the, the debt is just not going to be uh, recoupable. You know, so the entire debt-based structure of the system is, is, is now collapsing. You know, but but in a way, I think it's like the, one of the best things that could possibly happen to us at the moment, because you know, first of all, the the industri post-industrial economy is literally destroying the ecosystems of the planet and immiserating you know vast populations. Uh, you know, so 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 for it to to not be able to continue uh, would be a good thing, and for this to happen, you know, without you know nuclear war or you know martial law, you know, which you know is, it might be on the cards. But it, but it, but it seems to be happening in, a, in an almost kind of like um, uh, sudden, you know, deflation of the whole of the whole, you know, hypertrophied enterprise. Um, so I think there's a potential here for for a new proposition of, of value to to sort of enter the equation. And ideas like Bernard Lettier's ideas. I mean, he looks at the idea that you could create a different form of currency that that is resource uh, based. So it's linked to tangible assets, a basket of, of resources that everybody can agree upon have value. And it also, instead, it, it loses interest over time, just as most resources that are, that are useful to us lose value. You know, so food, like if you, if you have a hundred cupcakes, you know, you don't want to store them. You want to, you want to give them out to people because they're going to go bad in a day, you know. So, so if you had a, a negative interest currency linked to tangible assets, 
then instead of people trying to hoard it and then kill anybody else who comes within range of their possessions, you would actually create a situation where, where people would benefit most by sharing uh, their resources because the, the money is not going to last in value. But what is going to last in value is the relationships you form with other people. You know, so that, so that, that I think is a, a transformative model for value. And 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 then Lettier himself has been aware that there's going to be this insoluble crisis of the banking system, and so he's put forward this proposal in the form of the of the Terra, uh, T E R R A, as 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 a potential uh, global trading currency uh, for when this happens. So the the Terra combined with local currencies uh, could could be a model for transformation of a value of our of our sort of value proposition. And um, you know, yeah. So anyway, I'm, I'm talking a lot, but that's I think a very interesting idea. Well, one thing that comes to mind um, as far as that idea is the, the permaculture-based view of money. And if you, if you look at, at, at money from, from a, a permaculture perspective, it's a pollutant because it's too highly refined and it's found in very high concentrations. And so anything that is found in high concentrations and is highly refined and concentrated in permaculture terms is, pollut is a pollutant. You know, it's it's a poison. So, uh, it, you know, no matter what kind of a system you put together for money, it, it is going to be a violent influence on the natural world mediated by people. So if people just went around and bartered, they would be much, much more gentle to the earth than if they had any sort of money. As far as radical proposals, um, you know, if this, if this, dollar-based system completely implodes, implodes, you know, there, there are things that can be brought to bear that have been tried before, you know, refinements of previous techniques. For instance, we have a big problem with concentration of wealth where, you know, a very small minority owns most of the, uh, the stock. So you could, for instance, just confiscate all of it and nationalize all of it and then reprivatize it by issuing vouchers on a per capita basis with which people can buy stock. So voila, you've reprivatized the system, but now it's, uh, uh, it's, it's leveled because uh, the entire citizenry owns a share. Um, if, if, the, if you can't buy anything on the open market with dollars anymore because of hyperinflation, then uh, you, you just... Uh, Print a bunch of coupons for for the for the basics as as you know the Russians have done repeatedly and that works very well and if you want to put in some some elements uh, like you've you've mentioned where you know the interest is actually negative you just have those coupons expire after a while and that that solves that problem pretty well so there are all sorts of different approaches to try that have been tried before uh, but the thing to keep in mind is none of these things make anyone happy in the end they're all they're all just uh, Responses that that are responses to 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 negatives to bad situations, uh, coping mechanisms, if you will. Well, I don't know if I totally agree with the last thing you said. I mean, you know, I think if we look at um, you know periods of uh, great difficulty, uh, there are often times when people come together. And if you look at disaster scenarios, whether it was 9/11 or Katrina, it actually leads to a huge outpouring of uh, altruism. And, 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 you know, for me, like, um, you know, I mean, you know, I don't think you really looked at my work for 2012, but I mean, I, I you know, I, 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 part of what I would say, you know, could be coming our way is, is a kind of, uh, you know, spiritual renaissance. And as an aspect of that would be a kind of, you know, more compassion uh, based approach. And it may only be by experiencing like a really harsh, thrashing in, in, you know, in a, in a, in a you know, misery uh, period that people will really open their hearts to each other, um, you know, which there were, you know, examples of, you know, in, in the Great Depression or during the Second World War, you know, I mean, so, so, so for me, like, hu human nature is actually quite, um, you know, malleable, and, and to say that, um, you know, a difficult situation is definitely going to produce a negative outcome, I don't really buy that. I actually don't think people are happy at all in society as it's now constructed. I think people have a kind of hysteric, uh, you know, kind of fetishistic uh, enjoyment uh, in the midst of uh, obvious and overt uh, misery and, and kind of, uh, you know, nihilistic disgust. You know, so for me, that's not like a positive uh, scenario. So I think we could actually move into a much more human and humane uh, situation. 
Yeah, well, I agree with some of that. You know, this this cult of being busy that uh, that Americans practice, uh, um, basically running themselves into the ground faster and faster. Uh, you know, once that stops, a lot of people will go through some stage of severe psychosis, but the ones who emerge from it will will be, you know, closer to cured. <laughs> uh, you know, we can only hope for that. So, yes, I, I think that there are basically formative episodes in people's lives that can be viewed as as, some, as disasters, as something completely negative. Uh, a war, for instance, or, or a, a natural disaster, as you've mentioned, or, or an economic collapse that are formative experiences that transform people, that open them up to the world, allow them to see the world uh, directly as opposed to mediated by cultural symbols that they've absorbed over time. And, and you know, it's, it's you know, to use Gurdjieff's terms, it's an awakening. It takes an extreme event to awaken uh, quite a few people. And at the same time, there's a, a lot of uh, sort of, if you will, collateral damage. You know, people who uh, are in no position to wake up, they're just, they just suffer. Their, their lives are cut short and, you know, they, they, they don't make it, which I don't think it, you can balance those things out. You know, it's, uh, you, you can sort of look at them separately and say, well, so there, there are some positives there and there are lots and lots of negatives. Right. I mean, there's tremendous suffering happening all over the planet. You know, as we as we know right now in Africa or in Haiti, and you know a lot of this immiseration has been artificially caused by the you know kind of uh, inter- international you know financial system and the kind of empire domination model that's been used you know by by the by the kind of winners in, in the system, and um, you know that that system is going to have to go by the board, and I, and I think there's a lot of reasons to think. That it actually could go by the boards, and I'm very interested in like the work of um, Antonio Negri and Michael Hart, who are you know kind of political philosophers and political theorists, and other people who see um, you know first of all the growth of self-determination movements around the world, uh, the potential for um, collaborative action through the global commons, uh, a shift from hierarchical uh, control systems to kind of open source collaborative models of uh, production. Um, I, you know, I, I think that um, you know there, there, there's there's tremendous reasons to think that you know we have at least the the, the possibility of of moving into a into a much more positive uh, global scenario, uh, e- even as things get you know dark and chaotic. Yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of potential for that, and you know there will, there will be some kind of normal that we'll get back to after a time. I think we'll go through a stage of police state before that happens. You know, right now we're in this uh, you know hallowed place, a sort of uh, free speech zone called the internet. You know, and there there's a good part to it, which is while, while we're on it, we can say anything we want without repercussions. And the negative is the moment we step, try to step out of it, because all of our communications are electronic. They're very easily monitored. So if we try to actually organize some, something that will actually change social or physical reality in some tangible way, we will be very easy to track down and control. So I, I think that, you know, while this free speech zone lasts, I will be active within it. But stepping outside of it is, is uh, probably not, not advisable, especially as things wind down and, you know, the police state becomes ever more intrusive. Right, but I, I mean, I think that um, you know, who knows exactly what's going to happen. I mean, I, you know, personally, I think there's a good, you know, there's some chance, but you know, not not. I mean, I mean this, this, even this debate today will be very interesting to see if that goes on. But you know, there's some chance that there will be a kind of artificial pretext for suspending elections. Um, but there also already seems to be a kind of galvanizing movement of uh, awakening and, and action. And, um, you know, the, 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 there's a lot of different cross currents in the United States. And, you know, there's definitely a very pacified section of the population, but there's also a very large undercurrent, which, which is not so pacified and, and, and is beginning to, you know, very quickly become much more awake and aware. And then we also see that the, the communications, uh, you know, technology, the social technology that we've created allows for a, a very rapid growth in uh, collective intelligence and in, uh, you know, new group formation. Uh, there's a book called Here Comes Everybody by Clay Shirky that really lays, lays some of this out. So, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a time of duress, there, there might be amazing uh, potentials for, for this technology to, to aid in, in 
uh, you know, the, the growth of uh, collective intelligence and social awareness uh, across the United States. And it could actually happen uh, with extraordinary speed because these technologies are instantaneous and all the information is available online. Now, the other piece of the puzzle is that when you think about the um, potential for martial law, you know, at the moment, the U.S. is taking $2 billion per day, uh, you know, in, into its coffers from foreign investors to support a $1 trillion a year military budget. You know, if with the U.S. system, you know, potentially... Uh, you know, bankrupt and, and financial creditors no longer wanting to issue that kind of credit, you know, I'm not sure that the, the United States government will be able to fund a kind of police state transfer that they might want to fund. I mean, martial law is extremely expensive to, you know, police your home populace, to, to surveil their, their, you know, thoughts and interactions. When you're talking about, you know, 300 million people across a vast country, but I think one thing that's even that's slightly more possible in the near term would be uh, regionalization, that regions will kind of almost secede automatically because the, I'm not sure that the federal government will have the, the, the capacity to, um, to control the, this whole country. So, you know, we don't really know what's going to happen, but there are, a lot of, there are a lot of different factors at play, and some of those factors are even, you know, very interesting today. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, uh, what what will happen with the uh, with this debate and so on, and you know, what what will happen with uh, the the you know extraordinary support that uh, Obama continues to generate. You know. You're listening to the Sea Realm podcast, blowing your mind one week at a time. Welcome back to the Sea Realm Podcast. I'm your host, KMO, and I am joined by Daniel Pitchbeck and Dmitry Orlov. And recently, Daniel Pitchbeck published a chapter from Dmitry's book, Reinventing Collapse, on his website, Reality Sandwich. And Dmitry, in the chapter that appeared on Reality Sandwich, you talk about the communal myths that powered both the Soviet Union and the United States. And you describe these communal, these communal myths as being powerful enough to cause people to commit their insignificant yet essential selves to the righteousness and glory of the great whole. And in that respect, these communal myths are rather uh, maladaptive things. They, they cause us to sacrifice ourselves to something that is larger and in many ways unworthy. I wonder if you have a vision of how a communal myth that created group cohesion could really be used to the benefit of the people who are inspired by that myth. Well, uh, I, I, I think that one of the, the biggest communal myths that, uh, that the United States has is the idea that this country is a democratic country that is a force for freedom and democracy and prosperity around the world. And it's a bit battered now. It's not completely dead yet. Um, if, if it dies completely, if people can no longer use that as a psychological crutch uh, or as a filter with, through which to view the world, uh, then they will be forced to look inward and see what sort of a force they are in the world, in, in their little community, in their family, and whether it's for better or for good, and what sort of, what sorts of other rationalizations they're, they're making along the way and possibly part with those, no matter how painful that may be. And, you know, that, that would be uh, a way of personal transformation. Well, Daniel, I, I think you have quite a bit to say on the topic of personal transformation. So, if you would, we haven't discussed uh, psychedelics at all, and that's something that Dimitri has not written about or, or said anything about, to my knowledge. But I know it's something that you've said quite a bit about, and you have quite a bit to say. So, if you would, talk about the, uh, the potential for the psychedelics to provide sort of a catalyst for the necessary rapid transformation that will be required if we are going to respond adaptively to uh, what could be a very ugly situation. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, sort of, I sort of shy away from projecting that I, that I you know, know exactly what part psychedelics may or may not play. Um, I mean, right now it's, it's definitely some very interesting... Uh, research going on uh, with psychedelics, and they've kind of been allowing uh, you know, scientific research into them for the first time uh, really since the 60s. And among those studies that are interesting, there's, there's work going on in using MDMA uh, ecstasy uh, to treat uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. 
uh, and that could be, you know, very interesting with all these Iraq vets returning from the war and, you know, even, even a number of Wall Streeters may start to feel post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms in a few months. Um, you know, there's also um, studies on using uh, psilocybin to treat obsessive compulsive disorder and cluster headaches. Uh, you know, so, so, so it's a great moment for, you know, for psychedelic research. I mean, I, I personally think that, um, you know, they can be extraordinary tools for some people. I, I don't necessarily think that, you know, I don't, I don't really, I think that, that Leary's concept that everybody should, should, you know, do it when they're teenagers is probably not a very good plan. But it's definitely a very interesting moment for, for you know, for psychedelic research and, and discovery. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and you know, we, we, I, mean, I agree with Dimitri's perspective that, you know, there's a massive number of illusions um, that this country has been holding on to. And um, once again, you know, it's it's a great day when, when you know, delusions disappear. And, um, you know, we recognize, I mean, I mean, you know, there, there has, you know, there, there was a kind of, um, you know, new democratic impetus that came in with the U.S. a couple hundred years ago. And, uh, you know, even the idea that, you know, everybody had, you know, equal rights, uh, which was in the Declaration of Independence, although it didn't apply to Native Americans or black people in reality. Um, you know, that, 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 that's this extraordinary new philosophical concept for humanity. And, you know, ju just as we don't really deal with the actualities of what Christ had to say or Gandhi had to say or what was in the Declaration of Independence, we like to espouse those values. Uh, but at, at a certain point, you know, maybe we'll actually be able to integrate them and, and, and live according to them. Well, Dimitri, you, you talk about looking inward and finding some new source of guidance. And uh, what I take from your writings, and I, I know I'm... I'm projecting and I'm inferring quite a bit that hasn't been stated explicitly, but uh, I haven't really found much of a, a religious or uh, an overtly spiritual thread in your writings. And uh, I wonder if you think that there might be resources that are above and beyond or sort of meta to this, this reductive physical reality that people might draw upon in, in times of need and use as a resource for uh, a new sort of group cohesion and a new sort of means of finding our collective direction? Um, yes, I, I believe so. And, and uh, I think contact, daily contact with nature is what uh, makes people in, the, in this culture um, healthier, and lack of it makes people sicker. Um, you know, the, the most powerful hallucinogen that I've discovered, perfectly legal, is sailing long distances because if, if you're under sail out in the sea, out on the open ocean, you're con subjected, you're bombarded with white noise, and and uh, you you also have to maintain concentration at the same time, and the and the combination of the two produces hallucinations, whether you like it or not. It's just normal. Everybody expects that. You start hearing voices, and it's absolutely normal. And and uh, the situation is such that you, you you have to confront a lot of things within yourself, you know, questions of of loneliness, of self sufficiency, of, of various types of fears. Um, various parts of your personality come into play as you become very tired because, you know, it involves long shifts, etc. So that's like a, a very simple trial that somebody could go through and emerge a slightly different person. But even without going through something like that, just uh you know, sleeping close to the seashore can, can, can provide the same thing. Daily contact with animals, especially if you have to deal with wild animals that have not been, you know, polluted too much with contact with, with, uh, with uh, people, uh, just observing them, interacting with them in, in, in some non-invasive ways, for instance, you know, that's a very liberating thing for a lot of people. Um, a lot of people get, you know, get, get a lot of, uh, you know, the sort of... Uh, uh, not, not just physical sustenance, but something beyond it from simple simple uh, occupations like fishing, for instance. Um, uh, there, there's a lot to be said with, with just for, for just, you know, contact with nature. And, uh, you know, there, there, there are two paths, uh, it seems to me, um, in the direction of, of, of religion. One is to look for um, a thing that is bigger than, than you, this, this, you know, this, this, this superhuman godlike entity that you can then worship. Um, and the other one is to actually approach 
the superhuman godlike entity, which is nature, which is the natural world, and and realize how how infinitesimally small you are in in relation to it, and it's a similar sort of experience. You know, it's it, 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 the, the scale is so obvious and so overwhelming, and and uh, it uh, most people respond to that directly, you know, viscerally. They, they don't actually have to have any kind of, uh, you know, a great epiphany or, you know, they don't have to find faith or anything like that. There's really no faith involved. It's just observation. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, I don't generally, you know, I'll go in this direction very far, but those are the things that, I, that come to mind. That sounds great. I mean, I, 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 my question for Dimitri, in a way, is like, uh, I mean, what I took from your book was um, this kind of uh, anxiety-provoking uh, sense that I should be like stockpiling vodka bottles and condoms and, and uh, you know cans of tuna fish, and uh, I have to admit that like I'm still tempted to do that. Um, you know, what do you think? I mean, you know, do you, do you still feel? I mean, you know, but then I then I keep feeling that like um, you know if we go into this kind of mentality of everybody kind of hoarding. Uh, you know, is that going to be effective? You know, is, 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 you know, should it be more like attempt to create, you know, stronger communities, or should it be both? And I'm kind of, I'm kind of wondering, you know, first of all, how present and close do you feel like a, a real, um, you know, kind of crisis has reached the point where people, you know, are not going to be able to access, you know, the basic goods that are now so easily available, and what you feel that people, you know, should do right now in preparation. Well, it, it depends on who you are, because uh, I, I see people in extreme distress right here in the middle of a prosperous city, and I see more and more of them every day. So this is not something that is uh, in the future. It's in the present for quite a lot of people, and it'll be in the present for more and more people. As far as stockpiling food, well, you know, the, it, it makes sense to have a reserve of food if you uh, think that there is a, a, a period of extreme disruption on the way. Obviously, natural disasters fall into that category, but man-made disasters, such as the failure of, you know, the the, uh, uh, the debit card system, you know, would would, would do the same thing. Which, which, system? Can, which system? Debit cards. If, if okay. suddenly those stop working, if you can't get money out of a machine or, or swipe your card at a supermarket, a lot of people suddenly lose access to what they need. So... You know, for a period of time, and eventually something else will come uh, to replace it, or it will be restored. But things, things like that, fragile technological systems that people def- depend on as as a life support system. Um, you know, there, there are ways to to uh, make make yourself less susceptible to their failure by having a little bit of of a buffer. Now, stockpiling large quantities of food, I don't know that that's such a good idea. You know, it all has shelf life doesn't last that long. Plus, if you have a big hoard of stuff that's directly usable, um, people will take it away from you rather readily once they find out that, you know, you're well-fed and they're not. So um, other types of preparation, I think, are, are just sort of exercises that people can do. Um, uh, for instance, it's, it's good to spend time with people who don't have uh, access to computers or cell phones, don't have any use for them because that's a, like a normal way to be, and you discover what life is really like, you know, once you turn off all these devices. So that that's something that I encourage people to do, just turn it all off and live like that for a while and rediscover life. <laughs> um, a few other things that, you know, I might mention is, you know, skills are very important. Being, being able to work things like canvas and leather, for instance, uh, knowing how to, uh, how to do rope work, um, having some fundamentals on how to repair all the things that you depend on, like plumbing and electricity, for instance, being your own plumber and your own electrician. Um, very important if you want to have indoor plumbing uh, and, and if you want to have electricity in your house, um, because in the future it's unlikely that anyone will take it, take care of it for you. So th- those are the things that come to mind. So, yeah, reacquiring basic skills that, that many people used to have, uh, but we've kind of forfeited. I mean, there's a big... Have you looked into this whole uh, transition town movement uh, in the UK at all? Yeah, and it, it seems like a really good idea. You know, it's, uh, it's something to do, definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm all in favor of that. Well, I will say that uh, some of the advice that stuck most with me from Dimitri's book was... Get in shape. Dimitri, I know that you, you live on a, a sailboat and that you don't own a car. You ride a bicycle where 
distances that most of us would not consider covering by bicycle, and you do so regularly, and you consider the uh, the physical exertion and the pain of those trips to be some of the pleasures of life. So if you would say a bit more about that end of preparing for a, uh, a sort of post-peak world. Um, well, I, I think that, you know, a, a lot of the, the conveniences that people take for granted, um, you know, there's, there's a sort of ratcheting effect um, with conveniences where uh, they start out as a you know, a, a convenience and they end up as a necessity because you, the ability to get along without it atrophies over time. So people think that it's convenient to drive a car instead of, say, walking to the bus stop, and then they find that later on when they have to walk to the bus stop, you know, their knees start o- overheating. And it takes a long time for the joints to get back into shape, so that's something that once you lose it, it's very hard to get back. There are all these tragic stories of people who decide to get into shape and start running or something insane, insane like that. And, and uh... Well, it sounds like we have lost Dimitri. Daniel, I know that you need to get moving. So let me just uh, ask you one more question, and then I'll get Dimitri back on the line to, uh, to wrap things up individually. The Sea Realm podcast is not a debate show, and I was a little hesitant uh, getting you both on at the same time because I thought it might sort of turn into a debate, which I didn't want, and I was very pleased to see that you found a lot of points of agreement. One place where I know that you both agree is that you are very skeptical and not at all friendly to the notion that we are approaching a technological singularity where artificial intelligence and nanotechnology will combine to provide a limitless cornucopia and everybody will just be... uh, little pampered pets to these super intelligent machines. Dimitri doesn't like that idea because he thinks it's just ridiculous. He thinks machines are the stupidest thing in the world, you know, incredibly stupid compared to a newborn kitten. And I know that you're not friendly to that idea either, but as I recall from your book, your reasons are a bit different. And if you would, uh, talk about your skepticism concerning the singularitarian vision. Yeah, I mean, I go back and forth on this. You know, I feel like... um the, the the Ray Kurzweil vision is a kind of uh, transposition of uh, Christian, you know, sort of transcendent monotheism on, onto the technological world, and, I, and I'm very suspicious of it. And we really haven't seen any evidence that um, artificial intelligence will lead to machine consciousness that will, you know, develop, you know, rapidly, you know, into something that will basically make use of us as pets or zoo animals or something. I think there, there's there's some weird psychological complex around technology that we kind of want to to give up our will to it or something. Uh, However, I am very, very interested in uh, ideas such as those proposed by uh, Nassim Harami, the physicist, in his DVD set, Crossing the Event Horizon, where he argues that there may be an underlying kind of structural principle to space and time, to the vacuum, which is a a kind of uh, endlessly divisible uh, fractal structure that there might be technologies that are able to draw on this uh, divisible fractal structure to, um, you know, do things that are totally beyond what we now think we're capable of. And, you know, we, there may have even been this technology on the Earth in the past that would explain some of the just really bizarre, you know, monuments in Egypt where a thousand-ton stone was moved, you know, many miles, where we can't even, you know, our engineers can't even fathom how you could move a piece like that in, in, one, in one, you know, solid... Uh, you know, slab. Uh, so it may be that they possess technologies, or they would have had to possess something that we no longer we don't have. And um, so there might be a kind of anti-gravity uh, technology, uh, zero-point field technology that that we could bring into being. Now, what's interesting about that is if 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 it's according to Nassim, uh, is that it would basically be based on the same underlying principle of consciousness itself. So it potentially, you wouldn't actually be able to make proper use of it unless your consciousness was at a certain level of uh, development. Uh, so I think that, you know, I mean, in a way, technology might be a kind of expression of our consciousness, that our, our level of development of consciousness. And if we were to go into a different state of consciousness, a transition to a different form of consciousness, we might access a different type of technology or different level of technology that might be far more transformative of what, uh, to what we now use, but might also be much more like, psychically or consciously mediated. Um, so, so that's something that I, that, I, that I think about a lot and I think is actually uh, potentially uh, legitimate. And, and in a way, I almost feel like, you know, first we're going to go through this kind of initiatory uh, crisis where the structures that we've been that have that have gotten us to this point are kind of uh, 
destroyed. And it's almost like a kind of um, situation of a you know caterpillar creating a cocoon so that it becomes a butterfly. And the cocoon is this kind of technosphere that we've now built around the planet. And then the question is, how do we kind of break through that and emerge into like the next level of, of consciousness, which may actually uh, involve a whole different set of techniques, technologies, and tools, which we make use of. Uh, so that's a hypothesis. Of course, I don't know that it's the case, but uh, it's something I think about a lot. You mentioned the book Here Comes Everybody by Clay Shirky, and I'm reading that book right now, so it was a little... It had, came with a whiff of synchronicity that you, you mentioned that, um, and I'm very excited by the the trends that he is describing, and I can imagine that this this power of uh, technological tools giving individuals the ability to organize without big hierarchical organizations, uh, I can imagine that we're just in the very early stages of this, and even without any sort of artificial intelligence, just the progression of Moore's Law and the distribution of ubiquitous computing technology, you know, in smaller and more durable and less energy-consuming forms, could really empower people to behave collectively and with wisdom that, that we just don't do right now. Right, and then when those tools are used for things like, you know, protecting wilderness corridors or creating new wilderness corridors, you know, protecting species, use, using, uh, you know, like techniques that like people like John Todd and Paul Stamets have developed for bioremediation, I mean, you know, this whole mycelial model of a kind of um, collective intelligence, uh, you know, emerging uh, through the human species on this planet is one that, um, you know, I, I think might, ha- might, might, might be possible. You know. Well, before I let you go, let me ask you to talk a little bit about the uh, Coalescence Festival that is coming up in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. Right. I mean, I've, I've been so battered with busyness lately that, that I can't say that I know, uh, like, everything about this festival. But I, actually, I just looked at the website last night, and um, it looks really exciting. I mean, I, I, do, you know how many, do you know how many people they're expecting? Uh, a couple thousand, I think. And, you know, what's frustrating for me is that uh, Berryville, Arkansas, is ten minutes from there, and I have family there. And until recently, I lived about an hour from Eureka Springs. But I have just recently moved to Maryland. So uh, now that this wonderful festival with people like you and Alex Gray are, are coming to, uh, to Eureka Springs, I'm th- <laughs> hundreds of miles away. Well, maybe you should make the trip, because I think it looks like it's going to be um, a, a, a you know, really potentially like breakthrough event. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, my friend DJ Spooky is coming. Uh, you know, Alex is coming. Uh, Dennis McKenna is going to be there. Uh, d- different amazing musicians and so on. Yeah, I think it's going to be a good one. I agree. I, unfortunately, I will not be able to attend, but I will okay. uh, do my best to be there in spirit. Right on. Well, Daniel Pinchbeck, I very much appreciate your taking the time to uh, talk to the C-Realm audience, and I wish you safe travels. Okay, cool. Talk to you later.